Um, what I first want to say is I really appreciate this. I, I'm so thankful we're having these conversations and getting stuff going, but I also want to be a little bit of a jerk. Um, so this is a picture from when I, the first day I came to campus. This was 2004. This is the year we first welcomed undergrads to campus. And everything all around campus said the green campus or the green Cal State. Those were all removed in the wake of 2004. And we retreated quite substantially from our commitments. And that was very, that's been very disappointing um, to me. And I hope that this effort that we're doing here isn't, isn't doesn't follow the same paths um, that we had, uh, that we followed back then. We really had opportunity to be the leading campus in the whole nation in terms of sustainability, in terms of dealing with climate, and we retreated from that. Um, a little quote here from Mark Twain, he said, the truth is stranger than fiction, but it's because fiction is obliged to stick to the possibilities and uh, truth doesn't. So for example, fiction, we have things like this, right? We have Blade Runner that looks dystopian and crazy and weird. Actually, the world is increasingly looking like that, right? This is just a few months ago in San Francisco when my dad sent pictures from midday inside his bedroom. It was pitch black, um, in, in this case, due to wildfire, massive wildfires that were burning across the state. We see this not just here, but around the planet. You know, We all saw the, what was going on in Australia the last few months with the wildfires. And increasingly, this is what we're having to deal with. This is a very uh, you know, visceral experience here in Ventura County. This was in the wake of the Thomas fire where for a month, even people going surfing for all craziness had to wear respirators to go to the beach. This is what not taking leadership in climate change looks like. And increasingly, we're finding, I'm finding students that are talking about coming to CI are more interested in other campuses that are being more aggressive. People that are interested in grappling with this problem because they don't see us as dealing seriously with stuff. Um, as far as what's going on, though, uh, we've all spent this year stuck inside looking at predictions. This is from this morning of predictions for COVID, right? So we're all used to looking at these things of is the number going to go up, the number going to go down, et cetera. We have the same stuff when it comes to climate change, where we have these model predictions in terms of temperature rise, sea level rise, impacts, and you often see this range of results, which you don't I think what is not communicated is this is the conservative, this is the consensus result. So for a long time, we talked about California planning for one meter of sea level rise. Um, that Those models were the models that are agreed to by Putin, by George W. Bush, by the Indian government, by the Australian government, people that didn't believe in climate change. Really, we have models that show much more aggressive um, impacts from climate change, and those almost all are seeing... Um, we're now finding those are actually getting much closer to reality. These conservative estimates of a little bit of change, a little bit of warming, are almost assuredly underestimating the problem. As a consequence, uh, a year, uh, three years ago and then two years ago, the state of California revised its guidance. So instead of talking about planning for one meter, we now suggest planning for at least two meters. And quite possibly, we need we will soon need to plan for greater uh, impacts. What does that look like here on campus? If we don't have a really aggressive climate action plan and our colleagues don't, we see something that looks like this. So this is 2100, and um, this is the inundation from sea level rise. We will be awash. You'll notice that campus right here is cut out. So campus, we're in this area of medium vulnerability. We're, we're not in the area of medium vulnerability because of our levee system that's around uh, Cayugas Creek, et cetera. It's very important to maintain that. We do not um, pay super close attention to that, but, but if we aren't serious, the ocean will be very close to the edge of our campus door. Um, how am I doing? Almost out of time. So all kinds of impacts from these things. In the, in the case of sea level rise, um, we can talk about thousands, hundreds to thousands of miles of roads being impacted, hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens here in California being impacted, all kinds of economic impact, and on and on and on. We also see this very viscerally with um, fires, right, as we just talked about. So this is the extent of fires uh, over the, the data in the Late 1800s is a little bit squirrely, though we don't really have good data there. But, but starting in the about 1920, we have really good data. And you'll see this number, the size of wildfires is going up and up and up. And last year, it was over 4 million acres. Crazy. And, it, and it's only showing, we're only going upwards. So we need to deal with this if we don't want to burn up, for example. Here are all the areas around campus that have caught fire, a major fire in the last few years. And what you see is virtually everything burns. 
um, and has burned. Um, campus is burned. You guys are mostly young. You, have, you weren't here, but in 2013, campus itself burned. Everything around our built structures went up in flames. And, and in a few years ago, the Thomas fire, even when campus wasn't severely impacted, our offshore research station on Santa Rosa Island was swimming in smoke and it was very difficult to work out there. So we need to figure out how to deal with these problems because they are impacting you, they're impacting how you guys learn and on and on in addition to the sustainability concerns and everything else. Um, we're seeing unprecedented level of change. This is Montecito after the mud flow. How'd you like to clean out that uh, storm drain? It's a little challenging. These firefighters are like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Um, we're also seeing uh, uh, increased when it rains, it rains really hard. When it doesn't rain, it doesn't rain for a long time. So this is our drought monitor. We're entering right now. This is the um, second worst March we've ever had since we kept records. There was a time in the early 70s when it was drier, but this is becoming a, a phenomenon. We don't have enough water. Fire, heat, drought, etc. And then another aspect that can come, for, another benefit from an effective climate action plan is we can um, help ourselves directly in terms of our health. This is some of our data from our students that we've been tra tracking microplastics around the state. Every single beach we've looked at, full of microplastics. Every critter we've looked at, sand crab, fish, etc., full of microplastic. And you guys are becoming increasingly full of microplastics. And microplastics are tied to the same uh, petroleum carbon intensive eco uh, uh, economy that um, causes the problem with greenhouse gases. So if we, saw, if we deal with greenhouse gases, we'll also deal with some of these other pollutants. So for example, you are drinking microplastics when you drink your beer uh, or eat your food. We found it on the lower right in all of our agricultural soils around campus. And then this most recent study up on the upper right, we've been looking at how much microplastic is in the air we breathe. So if you're inside Sierra Hall or, or Student Union, you're gonna be inhaling twice the amount of microplastics as you would outside. And that again comes from our very carbon intensive economy. So uh, with that, I'll just end with saying that we have some great opportunities here with, with COVID and, and things of that nature. And uh, this is some survey work we did in the fall. Um, long story short, most people say they use more plastic during the last year. So we're, we're increasing our carbon footprint intensity in this past year. We need to be going the opposite direction. In these conversations we've had over the years, we've, we've tried to do something and then we've been told we can't do that, we can't do that, it's too costly, it's too costly. Um, I would suggest that as we talk about this plan, another quote from Mark Twain, we start off with a quote from Mark Twain, we're ending with a quote from Mark Twain. He said, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. So we shouldn't let the fact that we don't have a huge amount of money or whatever stop us from an aggressive climate action plan. We can figure out ways to get it done. But the problem we've had in recent years is we sort of get short-circuited. Don't get short-circuited. Let's make an aggressive plan. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I know I went really fast here. and didn't go super detailed. But, but thanks for the opportunity, Roxanne. And, and you guys, I'm looking so forward to an effective plan. Thanks, you guys. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Sean. That was a lot of very valuable and sobering.
dialogue and conversations during our breakout room discussion time. And if you have questions throughout the presentation or before we move to breakout rooms, please feel free to add your questions to the chat and our chat moderators will let our speakers know we have a question so that we can be sure to provide answers throughout the presentation. Perfect. And uh, to kick us off today, Kayla, Kayla and I would like to welcome and introduce our incredible guest speakers and presenters with you all. Recording in progress. Um, today, we have the pleasure of hearing from our university provost, Dr. Avila, student government president, Sophie Noyan, sustainability and energy manager, Roxanne Beigel Coriel. Uh, also joining us today is professor of environmental science and resource management, Dr. Sean Anderson. Professor of Communications, Jose Castro Sotomayor, and Parking and Transportation Demand Management Specialist, Maggie Domingo. Thank you all for being here with us. Uh, to get us started, I would now like to welcome our CSUCI University Provost, Dr. Avila, to share with us at this time. Thank you, Dr. Avila, for joining us and for sharing a few words with our CI community today. Thank you, Brian, and I'm very pleased to be here, particularly pleased to have the opportunity to, um, you know, just provide some opening remarks for this first uh, climate uh, action uh, summit or um, whatever we're, we're calling this, right? Uh, I know that we're the goal here is to create a, a sustainability plan, climate action plan for the campus. And I want to just uh, provide uh, assurance that uh, from the Division of Academic Affairs, we, we think this is a high priority for our campus. If, if Cal State uh, Channel Islands is going to be competitive in the region, provide our students uh, with uh, an education that equips them for uh, the, the next green economy, if it's uh, going to equip them to be leaders, um, and then they need to be you know, participants and find in their academic programs uh, opportunities to think seriously about um, climate change, about uh, you know, the, what a carbon footprint is, uh, steps that they can take as uh, leaders in, in in business and in, in the community to create a um, sustainable uh, practice for all of us, you know, no matter where they live, but especially here in Ventura County. So um, as we as we begin to think and strategize about where this campus will go over the next few years, I hope that one of our cornerstones uh, that we adopt is to be very uh, you know serious about. Um, building into all parts of the university a dedication and a commitment to uh, reducing our carbon footprint, to uh, being sustainable, being good stewards of our region, and setting an example for uh, the, the community and the rest of the state in terms of our commitment to these important values. So it's something that's, uh, that's strong about uh, CI and something that uh, I look forward to working with all of you with and in terms of growing that and developing that over time. So thanks for inviting me. I, I am actually supposed to be in another meeting with the chancellor's office. So I'm gonna jump off right here, um, but I uh, very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to this and, and wanna assure you that you have uh, the full support of the provost's office. All right. Thank you, Provost Avila, for your insight and leadership today. We look forward to our continued work together as a CI community. I would now like to welcome Student Government President Sophie Nguyen to share. 